if you can hear me. No? Is that better? Grand. Right. Uh, I'd like to start by saying a little bit about how this talk came about. It was 2015, and that, of course, was a significant date. Uh, the Guildhall Library wanted to mount an exhibition on the 1665 Great Plague, and um, they wanted an accompanying talk. So I volunteered. And at that time, I was conscious of the fact that we didn't really have a context to put a great epidemic into. And fortunately, I don't know whether fortunately or unfortunately, uh, my daughter was working for an international charity in Africa at the time of the Ebola outbreak. And I put the idea to her that she might like to make this into a two-hander so that we could um, put the audience into the mindset of a community threatened by an epidemic. Now, here we are. It's 2023. We have been through COVID-19. Do I need to put you into the mindset of a community threatened by an epidemic, indeed a pandemic? No, I don't. Um, we've been there. We've all got the T-shirts and sometimes something a little bit grimmer in the way of memory to take with us. So I don't need to use the Ebola connection anymore. Um, we all know what it is like to be faced by something that is absolutely terrifying. And let me then take us back to 1665. I don't think that it's too difficult a jump for us to make. Um, we tend to think nowadays about 1665 as a time of the Great Plague, as if there were no other. But of course, in the 17th century, Londoners were accustomed to frequent outbreaks of plague. Uh, death in majesty here was an all too familiar figure. Death triumphant, clothed in ermine, round whose bones do crawl the vermin, doth denote that each condition to his power must yield submission. Grimly familiar, because plague was a repeated visitor to Europe. Um, this was a devastating invasion. The invaders might be small, the black rats, the fleas, the clothes mites and hair mites, which we're now told um, aided transmission from person to person, but they were quite terrifying, quite deadly. And we need to remember that as far as the people of 1665 were concerned, this was just another one of a whole series of invasions of plague. Uh, these had been frequent ever since the time of the Black Death. Uh, the Black Death, which spread westward from the steppes of Asia, finally, reaching the shores of the Mediterranean with staggering effect by 1348. Nowhere was safe, even Venice. Now, Venice responded very swiftly, very intelligently, quite wholeheartedly to the danger of the plague. Um, it nevertheless failed to cope with the huge numbers of the dying and the dead. Although 
it had introduced a system of quarantine, 40 days of isolation of incomers. And from 1424, it actually used an island in the lagoon as a place of isolation and burial. Nevertheless, Venice itself lost between 90 and 150,000 people to the Black Death. And the Black Death generally diminished the population of Europe by between a third and a half with all kinds of economic consequences. What about Florence? Well, in Florence, the dead, and this is a very, very grisly image, the dead were piled up in pits like cheese between layers of lasagna. Very, very Italian way of thinking of things. And until the 16th century, bubonic plague would return to Europe every six to 12 years. Well, as the plague mutated, there was no longer mention of sneezing and coughing up blood, but continued reference to buboes, plague sores, roses. These continued as the main marker of the infection. And a doctor at the time identifies unquenchable thirst, dryness, blackness of the tongue, vomiting and delirium. Well, if you wanted divine protection, you turned to the saints and the saint you prayed to most was Saint Roche. And here he is rather like a, a tiller girl of the time uh, displaying his plague sore on his thigh. Um, he didn't really provide very much help, but he might have been a comfort to some. After 1500, the intervals between the outbreaks of plague became longer. They were as much as 15 to 20 years apart. But the plague could still account for the deaths of between 80, 18 and 30% in the communities affected. And between 1500 and 1665, England experienced 16 separate epidemics, seven of them major. Between 1600 and 1665 also, it's worth noting that the population of the city had increased dramatically from around 200,000 to almost double that, 350,000. And the result, around the periphery of the city particularly, was gross overcrowding and, in many places, absolutely deplorable sanitary conditions. Well, here is one of the bills of mortality for 1624, 1625. These are the closest we get to an accurate statistic about the disease. Although in many respects, in the case of the Great Plague of 1665, as I'll go on to touch on later, they may not be entirely reliable. However, they did act as an early warning system. The king and the Lord Mayor would see them as soon as they were published. So ideally, they would be in a position to act swiftly and shut up infected houses. But just notice here what parishes are worst affected. They are the parishes just outside I can get this to work. Sorry. 
There the parish is just outside the city proper. No, I can't get it to work. Oh, thank you, Robert. Right. Well, let's see. Let's see if I can get that to work. Yes, it's working at the top there, so bring it. Oh, right. Thank you. Got it. Okay. These are the sort of parishes that were worst affected, and they are the, the liminal parishes. They're the parishes right around the fringes of the city. If you think about the, the city wall uh, to the north of the city, I think you'll agree the Romans didn't do us any favors by building a wall there uh, in an area that is full of springs. The result is that that part of the area just outside the city proper becomes very marshy, marshy and unhealthy, as those people who were forced to camp out in that area after the Great Fire of London of the following year uh, experienced to their cost. So these parishes in particular the parishes just on the fringe of the city were the parishes that were most badly affected by the plague of 1625 and the plague of 1665. Which brings us back to the biggest outbreak since the Black Death. Now, London was not entirely unprepared. In 1664, there was a 30-day isolation order on shipping from the Netherlands. Well, understandably the Netherlands, because we were uh, sporadically at war with them during this period. And since the time of Henry VIII, there had been some provision for the isolation of people suspected of the plague. But the preparations in London weren't remotely on the same scale as the preparations in other great continental cities. So for a comparison or two uh, of Britain's continental neighbours, Venice had two isolation hospitals on islands in the lagoon. In Milan, the St. Gregory Hospital was larger than the cathedral. Amsterdam had built a large hospital in the 16th century. Paris had the Hôpital Saint-Louis. What about London? Well, two small pest houses in Westminster and Cripplegate, plus St. Bartholomew's Hospital, which had only two to 300 beds, and St. Thomas's, a mere 250. So St. Bartholomew's, total of at most 300 St. Thomas's, another 250. Nothing on the scale of our continental neighbors. And worse still, there wasn't very much centralized direction of efforts to control the spread of infection. The Lord Mayor and the Aldermen occasionally intervene. Likewise, the King and the Justices. You can see an example here of the Lord Mayor trying to make some progress. But the campaign was largely fought at parish level, in a parish like this one here. Now, in 1665, there were 97 parishes within the city walls, 16 without the walls, 12 so-called out parishes in Middlesex, and five in the city and liberties of Westminster. Well, a little bit more later about the organized responses to the plague. But now, what about the causes? Well, maybe astrology could give an answer. Maybe 
we had just been too naughty. Maybe the plague was a visitation from God to punish the wickedness of mankind. Uh, and incidentally, this was a notion strengthened by the observation of a comet. Certainly, certainly people thought it was prudent at least to look for a spiritual answer. But much thought was also devoted to possible physical causes. You can see that here. One cause of the sickness is the corruption and infection of the air. For when the plague begins to reign in any place and the pestilence is as it were sown among the people, the sick continually not only breathe out of their mouths, but send out of their bodies infectious steams and vapors. This is a notion that was going to persist way into the 19th century. Maybe typhoid, uh, the Victorians thought, was spread in this way. Infectious steams and vapors, which being dispersed and scattered in the air, are soon after drawn in by the breath of others, and thence whole families are extinguished. And the plague not only creeps, but runs from one house to another. And hence it is that the plague destroys more in cities and in countries, and more in narrow streets and lanes of those cities than in open places, because usually there are narrow and little rooms which are soonest filled with infectious vapors and longer keep them in. For though they erupt, you must draw it in with your breath continually, for without it, you cannot live an hour. Well, you can't live more than a few minutes or so. Um, if we think back to the ideas that were current at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, when no one was quite sure whether the infection was spread by contact or through the air, you can see much the same speculation going on. So what can possibly stop this transmission from person to person. Well, here's an afterthought. It is remarkable that when the plague raged in London, Bucklersbury, which stood in the very heart of the city, was free from that distemper. The reason given for it is that it was chiefly inhabited by druggists and apothecaries, the scent of whose drugs kept away the infection which were so unnatural to the pestilential insects that they were killed or driven away by the sm strong smell of some sorts of them. The smell of rue and the smoke of tobacco were prescribed as remedies against the infection, but especially tar and pitch barrels, which it was imagined preserved Limehouse and some of the dockyards from infection. So here we have uh, a few more ideas. Maybe smoke is the answer. And we know that bonfires were lit at street corners as one way of trying to deal with the spread of infection. And what could individuals do? Well, peeps, We've got to get to Peep sooner or later, especially in this church. Uh, Peeps, on the 7th of June, 1665, after seeing two or three houses in Drury Lane marked with a red cross upon the door, and Lord have mercy upon us, set there, which was a sad sight to me, being the first of the kind that to my remembrance I ever saw, what does Peeps do immediately after seeing this? He goes and buys roll tobacco, not only to smell, but also to chew. And incidentally, here's a historic first for us. Incidentally, Eton boys were beaten if they did not smoke in the street. Thinking about Boris, no, 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 I won't, I won't go there. So what is happening? 
to check the plague. Well, by the 5th of September, bonfires were ordered to be set on street corners, while, uh, hang on a minute, what's happening here? Uh, this is an interesting scene. Um, what are those men doing brandishing weapons? Well, I'm afraid some of the first victims were the dogs and the cats of the city. It was thought they might be responsible for spreading the plague, but uh, hey, it's an ill wind that blows no one any good. The rats, I'm sure, held parties at this time, uh, seeing their traditional enemies being slaughtered by the hundreds. Let's go back to that picture. And what do we see? Well, reading from left to right, we've got two individuals with staffs of office. These are approved searchers for the plague. Just to their right, we can see that the killers of dogs and cats have had a fairly busy day because here is a man wheeling a barrow uh, full of the corpses of the city's pets. Then on the right, we've got a sedan chair taking a plague victim to the pest house. So if this is what's happening outside, what's happening inside? Here's an orderly scene. We've got the searchers, two of them still with their staffs of office. We have a gentleman in the middle left, um, proving that the plague does still produce outbreaks of vomiting. We have a victim in a bed and another on the floor. Someone has been prudent enough, if tactless enough, to leave a coffin ready in the middle of the picture to receive whoever is next for it. And we have the, the burning of herbs. Well, it all looks very, very sensible, very orderly, but does it really correspond to any reality? Uh, I think the answer is probably not. In reality, neighbors frequently broke open sealed up houses. Uh, the watchmen and the searchers were desperately poor, so they were susceptible to bribery. And it's not surprising that many cases went unreported, which is something we need to come back to in a moment. Uh, what about other views of this time of pestilence? Well, again, this is very reassuring. It's a grand funeral procession. It's equally unrealistic. Uh, large assemblies, understandably, were forbidden. On a slightly more modest scale, here is a very orderly, if unpretentious, mass burial, very properly carried out, coffins being decently borne to the graves, Again, it is unrealistic. Even at this modest level, burials soon overtook churchyard space. So new burial sites needed to be opened up. And you can see here that instead of individual graves being dug, there is a movement towards mass burial. And here is the play cart. The reality was often much more like this. And I don't know whether one of your first experiences of the 1665 plague was Daniel Defoe's account in Journal of the Plague Year. It was, it was my first uh, brush with the 1665 plague, and it was only later that I realized that Defoe 
was only five years old at the time of the plague, and he was getting most of his gen from printed sources and from the, the memory of his uncle, who was uh, an Oldgate butcher, Henry Foe. But this is Defoe, as convincing a journalist as ever. Now, at the beginning of September, the plague raging in a dreadful manner, and the number of burials in our parish increasing to more than was ever buried in any parish about London, of no long, uh, sorry, of no larger extent, they ordered this dreadful gulf to be dug. This is the plague pit close to St. Botolph, Ongate. They ordered this dreadful gulf to be dug, for such it was rather than a pit. And this huge burial pit was filled in two weeks with 1114 bodies. Well, let's stay with the for a while. Of the bearers, says Defoe, many of them were very idle, base living men, and very rude they were. You can imagine this is not the job you're looking for when you go down to the job center. Uh, it's a job that you will only take if you are desperate, or perhaps if you are of a somewhat morbid cast of mind. And this is what Defoe says of them. Many of them were very idle, base living men, and very rude they were. Among them was a wicked fellow named Buckingham. It was this ghoul's practice when among the piled corpses of the dead he carried were those of any children to cry in the deserted streets, faggots, faggots, five for sixpence. And he would take up a dead child by the leg and repeat his cry, five for sixpence. Sobering stuff. At the lips of the yawning plague pit, he took frenzied delight in exposing the naked bodies of young women openly to view, and his other actions were equally monstrous. While the contemporary prints frequently present a sanitized, orderly view of proceedings, they couldn't overlook the glaring fact that most of those Londoners who were able to quit the city once they recognized the magnitude of what was happening there, well, they did so. Um, here's, a, here's an attempt to justify this practice. Question and answer. Is it lawful to depart from our own place and habitations in time of plague? Answer. Provided a man be not tied by the relations of a husband to a wife, a father to his children, a master to his family, a governor and overseer of good order in the place he lives in, and be otherwise free, he may fly. And the watermen set up a refuge on the Thames for 3,000 people. But most chose to leave by land. An estimate says about 200,000 people attempted to leave London by land routes. Uh, Pepys's mother did it, so did his wife, so did his servants. Pepys himself, to his credit, Noted at the cross keys in Cripplegate, I find all the town almost going out of town, the coaches and wagons being all full of people going into the country, but he didn't join them. So what awaited those people who attempted to fly London? Well, the answer is they didn't find themselves made very welcome, understandably they were seen as potential plague carriers. And although we see here 
London's charity opposed to the country's cruelty, I think the reaction of those people faced with um, the 200,000 fleeing the city of London was not only understandable, but uh, justifiable. However, unlike um, recent history, where, as we know, the prime minister and cabinet uh, stayed in pestilential London, uh, obeying all the edicts that they themselves had passed down to the people. Uh, King Charles II did quit London. Uh, the king himself went to Oxford and Pepys visiting Westminster marveled at the grass growing along the streets in Whitehall and Thomas Vincent, who's another great recorder of the time of plague, Thomas Vincent reported a deep silence almost in every place, especially within the walls. No rattling coaches, no prancing horses, no calling in of customers, no offering of wares. So, what about those people who stayed in the city? Well, as I suggested earlier, the ones worst affected were the ones who lived in the poorest quarters, usually just outside the city walls. Uh, this was known as the poor's plague. A parish like that of St. Giles Cripplegate where houses, shacks really, were clustered most densely. These were the places that were most appallingly affected. And if you visited an area close to a place like St. Giles's, you could expect to find no warm welcome there. This is John Evelyn, and he visited the city about business of money. He alighted from his coach to find himself environed with multitudes of poor pestiferous creatures begging alms. The shops universally shut, a dreadful prospect. Well, Pepys, as I suggested, um, was dutiful, and I think we can grant him quite brave. Uh, he went on working as an admiralty official, and he said to Sir William Coventry, you, sir, take your turn at the sword. I must not, therefore, grudge to take mine at the pestilence. But sometimes, he found himself uncomfortably close to the front line. Uh, this is from the 17th of June, 1665. It struck me very deep this afternoon, going with a hackney coach from my Lord Treasurer's down Hoburn, the coachman I found to drive easily and easily at last stood still and came down hardly able to stand and told me that he was suddenly struck very sick and almost blind. He could not see. So I alight and went into another coach with a sad heart for the poor man, Pepys has to be honest, and travel for myself, lest he should have been struck with the plague, being at the end of town that I took him up. But God have mercy upon us all. Public meetings of all kinds were, wherever possible, canceled. There were no fairs anymore for all those left in the stricken city, virtually all that could be done was to implement a policy of containment. Large gatherings were canceled. And 
more and more land was taken over for increasingly unceremonious burials, uh, such as the burials in the graveyard bordering Bedlam. Well, this was a time for on men to excel themselves. Many of the gullible who could afford it invested in quack remedies like these. Uh, peeps simply carried a hare's foot, but others went in for more elaborate precautions, um, which often were counterproductive because they gave uh, a false sense of security an excellent cordial against the plague, exactly prepared, approved to be of singular virtue and sold at easy rates by Richard Marriott near Chancery Lane, at the Anchor and Mariner in Tower Street, by Andrew Kemp at St. Margaret's Hill in Southwark, at the Turk's Head in Cornhill, at the Sun in the Pontry, and by Mistress Anne Smith in Little St. Helens, and nowhere else. Well, of course, they didn't work. What about the doctors? Well, 80% of the College of, Phys of Physicians had fled the capital. Uh, there were only about 250 to 300 doctors left in the London area. And they included not just doctors, but apothecaries, surgeons, um, paramedics, as I suppose we would now call them. There were heroic exceptions, like George Thompson here, who attempted the first truly scientific dissection of a plague victim. But for the most part, all they could do was catalog the spread of the disease. Here's the parish register for St. Giles Cripplegate, which was by far the worst affected of any London parish. And you just go down the list and you see a few entries like Dropsy, plague, 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 spotted fever. Can we really believe these other entries, given that the number of dead is so dramatically increased at the time of the plague? Um, peeps, again, we come back to, uh, we come back to peeps. Uh, Peeps inquired of his local um, individual in this parish responsible for recording deaths, his parish clerk. And the parish clerk, when asked how many had died of the plague in the last week, said, uh, well, nine, but I recorded just six. There was a terrible temptation to under-record. So, well, where did the 1665 plague come from? And how much devastation did it cause? Dr. Nathaniel Hodges argued it has started with packs of merchandise from Holland. Holland, of course, at this time, always the, the number one victim to point a finger at. Uh, packs of merchandise from Holland, whose origin was probably Turkey, bales of cotton or silk, which is a strange preserver of pestilential steams. And Daniel Defoe, again, let's remember, he was only five at the time. Daniel Defoe claimed very conveniently, it began with two Frenchmen. If you can't blame the Dutch, always blame the French. It began with two Frenchmen in Long Lane. And as far as the effects of the plague are concerned, all we've really got to rely on are these parish records and the bills of mortality. Well, there are 
all sorts of temptations to under record the number of plague deaths. Perhaps the best sums we can do are based on the increase in the total number of deaths recorded in 1665, as opposed to those in the previous year. So we have a register for August 1665, and it's the register, of course, for St. Giles's of Cripplegate. Beginning of June, plague deaths recorded as one of 37, and then later three of 36. By the end of the month, these figures have increased to 32 of 96. Now, just think, 37 deaths increased to 96. And of course, that figure of 32 is totally unrealistic. By the end of August, 602 of 802. Again, it leaves a whole 170 unaccounted for. So you need to do your sums when you're looking at the bills of mortality and your sums will, I'm sure, convince you that there is substantial under-recording here. By August, well, it's plague, 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 with a very few exceptions. Again, spotted fever is quite a good excuse to misrecord a plague death. Let's look at the totals here. Uh, I, I'm always fascinated by the causes of death. Um, French pox, 86, frighted, 23. Um, head mold, heart and mold fallen, jaundice in costume, killed by several accidents. But let's look at the totals. Buried, males, 48,569, females 48,737, in all 97,306, of plague 68,596. Increased in the burials in the 130 parishes and at the Pest House this year, 79,009. Terrible figures, even though they are bound to be an underestimate. Well, I suppose we need to we need to consider the factors that might lead to underestimate. Um, well, error, misdiagnosis, bribery, parish pride, even. You don't want to be seen as a lousy parish um, with people dropping dead all over the place. Maybe failure of reporting, omissions. Think of the people who wouldn't be included in these bills. Um, those found dead on the street, dissenters of whom there were a number. The Total, accepted total, allows for 97,306 burials, 68,596 of plague victims. Um, how far wrong is that? Well, I'm no epidemiologist, so I have to rely on people who are. And um, there is a married couple by the memorable name of Moot, who've published on the Great Plague of 1665, their estimate is possibly 110,000 deaths of the plague as a more 
realistic figure. Now, with the population in London in 1665 running at about half a million, even the figure of 68,996 would make the plague toll 19% of the population. But we've got to consider that about 40% of the people who normally lived in London would have got the hell out. So this being the case, it would push the mortality percentage even given that low figure published in the bills of mortality, it would push that figure up to around 33% of the population. Well, really daunting figures. This will be a familiar sight. By the 31st of January, 1666, Pepys considered the city safe enough for his wife to return from Woolwich. Next day, 1st of February, he's round at the vicarage petitioning the vicar to sow the churchyard where 93 bodies had been buried since July with quicklime because he is scared of reinfestation. So what happened? How did the plague go? Just as the plague arrived dramatically, it abated equally dramatically with the arrival of cold weather. So by the 12th to the 19th of December, the total for even the dreadfully visited parish of St. Giles Triplegate was down to seven plague deaths from a total of 19 burials. And the following four years were to see plague deaths in London to decline to less than a handful. 1666, well, it was down to manageable numbers by 1669, just two people died of the plague in London. So death in majesty was finally deposed by 1679. The last London plague death was in a remote downstream parish. And although there were later scares, the plague wasn't to return to London. Well, not until 2019 anyway, but that was very much a different kind of plague. And we, I think, from our position as survivors of COVID uh, can begin to understand, albeit not perhaps totally understand just how devastating 1665 might have been. There were no regular evening talks to reassure us that the NHS was getting on top of COVID. Um, Londoners were very much in the dark and no wonder they were scared. And if they didn't, beat their pots and pans on their doorsteps in the Thursday evening of each week, well, I think we can understand why not. So thank you very much for your sharing with me this experience, this unpleasant experience of 1665. And I hope that death in majesty doesn't, doesn't haunt you for too long. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.